Thanks for sticking around. This is going to be fun. Len Nesfer, Native Outdoors, boss of the only for-profit avalanche center in the U.S. Yeah. Nina Waters, Summit County Commissioner. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Carolyn Gleick, U.S. Senate candidate, going for it. <laughs> and boss skier. You skied all 90 of the shooting gallery lines, something, right? Yeah. That is so badass. Um, so, we're going to talk about the outdoor industry. We're going to talk about politics. We're going to be talking about what inspires us to step up and get in the brightest of lights and fight for change. Um, super intimidating process, as we all know. Um, and you guys are out there, tip of the spear, fighting for fighting the good fight. Um, Caroline, let's start with you. Um, you, last month, announced you were going to push for the big hot seat top house U.S. Senate replacing Mitt Romney in a um, in a tough state. Yes. Um, <laughs> you have also been a tremendous mountaineer, super accomplished with a sense in the Himalayas and all sorts of backcountry stuff. Talk a little bit about what your experience in the backcountry that you see enabling you to move forward into this entirely new but equally intimidating realm yeah well ever since i was a little girl i've always had a dream of climbing and skiing the biggest mountains in the world and when i told people about my dreams they would look at me with skepticism like i'm pretty small you know and when i was a kid and i was telling people what i wanted to do I was extra small then, you know, I was the runt of the litter of my family with three brothers. People would be like, you want to go where and do what? You're going to die. You should stay home or just go to base camp. Don't go up to the summit. Don't go to the summit of Everest. Like that's not a place for someone like you. And along the way, I really wanted to use my platform to help create a positive change for people on the planet. And it's the same thing. When people look at me, they don't see a mountaineer or a politician. So I'm used to defying odds, I'm used to breaking stereotypes, and I'm used to doing what people think is impossible. And when people tell me something's impossible, that only makes me want to do it more. So as, when it comes to running as a Democrat in Utah for the Senate seat, it's an impossible challenge, but it's one that I'm up for. <laughs> Um, Nina, you are in the hot seat in one of the m most, I, I feel like Summit County exemplifies a lot of our mountain town issues. It's like everything is really yet ahead there with some housing, equitable access, truly busy ski resorts, and you know major corporate influences, which grew by one today with Altera taking over a basin. Um, so... <laughs> So as Nina was saying, people were calling her, asking her what she could do <laughs> about that. Um, I would love to have heard your response. But um, talk a little bit about, you know, tackling just a whole lot of big issues that are, you know, that it's, it's right there on, in your face in Summit County. It's so evident. And one thing that I hope all three of us can talk about, too, is we just heard, you know, a couple panels ago, the snowboard skier fight is over. And we're really starting to see silos torn down in the outdoor recreation industry. And people are coming together and realizing, like, hey, I ride motorcycles and I hunt and I also hike in the backcountry. And I, I ski and we do it all, right? Like, there's no real just one group, um, you know, and fighting, inner fighting. It's really coming together to become quite an economic and cultural force. So you have a little history background with Blizzard, Blizzard, Technica. Um, yeah. Kind of curious as to what you draw out of the outdoor recreation industry, your, your inspiration in the outdoors, as well as what we're seeing in the industry itself with some of these silos falling down, this industry really stepping up saying, man, we are a cultural force. Let's make some change here. Well, easy. It's 
Real quick. Um, <laughs> Real quick. <laughs> <no>. <laughs> uh, well, I, can, I guess I can start with, um, like we said, my name's Nina Waters. I'm a Summit County Commissioner. Um, I came into this space, this exact room, about a year ago, whining and complaining about people not being involved and activating themselves politically and engaging with you know, the problems that are existing in our world. And then I did that. Um, and it was, it's hella scary. Um, and I'm still learning every single day. Um, but I wake up every day with the opportunity to shape the lives of those who live, work, and play in Summit County. Um, I'm sure many of you all live in very similar environments like Summit County. Maybe not to our extent because we are, we are the gateway to the mountains. Mm, so lovely to think about. Um, but we deal with just a, a massive amount of just forces that really threaten our lives, not only, you know, in what we like to do, but the existential crisis that is existing around us. Um, and there's more than one. That's the problem. Um, and I think that the, the thing that I take away every day um, in this work, um, and if you don't know what a county commissioner does, just look it up. It's, it's a lot of random things. But one of those things, we try to, basically at the core of it is I try to make lives better, right? And that in, involves you know, making sure that we can get the roads plowed and making sure that the potholes are filled. And I'll be it, I'll be it maybe we aren't the best at that because we're also trying to incentivize affordable housing while simultaneously being the, the voice at the top of the headwaters of the Colorado River, the main vein of water throughout the entirety of the West. Um, you know, there's all of these things have taught me personally in this gig every day is that everything we do is interconnected. Um, not only, you know, in our hobbies, but just in life in general. So why, why are we so siloed? That's the question that I always ask myself. Why, why is it, well, all I care about is I'm a one issue voter. I care about this thing. And that's going to determine every single thing that I, I make my decisions about. But yet, what decision you make over here in this one zone, also, how does that impact this that's going over here? So I think that that's the biggest thing that I'm, I'm taking away on a daily basis. And I think it's really important and my goal moving into like, you know, the next phase of my career, which is, I guess, politics, Ooh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, which is to engage with all of you, every single one of you in this room. We all owe it to ourselves, to each other. We want to make this world a better place for not only ourselves, but for our children and the legacy we leave behind. Well, then we have to engage. We can't just sit back and, and, and watch it all happen and trust that these elected officials are gonna have all the answers. Because I can tell you what, there's a lot of people making a lot of decisions about your day-to-day -day life that, that are idiots, okay? <laughs> And you could be one of those people. Like, you don't have, I mean, I mean, and I don't mean that as an idiot. You're no, we're, we're the, the idiots. idiots. Yes. Yes. That's we're the campaign that slogan, 2024. <laughs> but really, we are, you, I, I know nothing about what it is that I, I didn't know anything. I was engaged and I was curious. But all it takes is that, that genuine curiosity and that desire to want to do something for your fellow man. And so I think that, we all have the capacity, and that's what I, I stepped into the hot seat, but it, I don't deny that every single one of us could, could not do the same, so, yeah. And they're 80-year-old idiots. I know, they're year old so idiots. old. What the fuck? Uh, <laughs> they, can't even, they can't even get a driver's license. No, I know. They are too old to drive a car, oh. and they want to run the free world. What the I've hell is so wrong many, with us? We've got so many good old boy stories. <laughs> Being in Colorado, uh, we are, it's, it's pretty, pretty expansively in the state of Colorado. Most county commissioners are good old ranch boys. And I walk in there wearing like usually like my most aggressive like punk rock t-shirts because I just want to like watch them squirm. Um, 
And it, is, it feels really, really good. And they're just like, what is this girl doing? And I'm like, I don't know, but I'm just trying to figure this shit out. Now, that one, <laughs> that one issue voter, I think, is fading away. That is, that's the same sort of mentality that kept skiers not liking snowboarders and kept motorized users not hanging with hikers. And I see that being torn down in our world and in many ways I see how we could be the outdoor industry could be the example we could be the model for purple for destroying the bifurcated political system for you know figuring out how where we all actually meet you know the land you've been on you've been fighting this fight for a long time now um talk to us a little bit about are you seeing that kind of change on the ground? Are you seeing more people coming and recognizing your mission to, to raise voices that have always been in the shadows? Yeah, I think, oh man, I worked in government. I understand why you operate slow, but my God, I could not operate in that <laughs> world. You know, and I think that's, you know, having, uh, you know, I would just say for all of you, government operates the way it does for a reason. It's slow for a reason. Having that sort of embedded friction allows for changes to stick. And, but also that needs to have that longer term vision that in order to institute the changes or whatever we wish to see of our governments and how they serve us, it's gonna take a fucking long time to make those changes stick. And persistence is key. Um, I. My background is I grew up in a Navajo family and my dad's side of the family is from Michigan. And that side of the Michigan family is like fully evangelical, IBLP, crazy, crazy religious folks. No, no shade on people here that are religious, but these folks are out there. Um, but one of the things that I see about their movement is that they stick with the cause. They, they're in it for the long haul and they said this is a God-given mission for us to change politics the way in the way that we see fit and I think one of the things that I see about our community is that we're so easy to give up we're so easy to say once we start facing hardship or any sort of friction of the things that we're doing we give up we say it's too hard but those folks keep keep grinding away and you think about the things that you do in your own life maybe it's a climbing project you're working on or something that you're doing in your own ski you know athleticism and that grind and that grit that you put to that, if you put that to politics, holy shit, like the things that we could do as an outdoor community, if we just put our minds to this and say, this is a multi-generational project, this is a multi-generational effort, and I might not succeed, but I might pave the path for someone after me to come and make it so much easier for them to make these changes stick. And I think that's one of the things that is that the persistence is really at the key. If we wish to see changes in our system, things right now, like I un completely understand if we look at politics right now and we say, this is not working for me, I'm checking out. It's easy. It's, that's an easy out. That's like the easy way out. But the harder way is to say, I'm going to grind this out and try to figure out if I can make a difference. If I don't, I'm going to make it easier for the person behind me. And when I look at my crazy religious family that wants to see this crazy world that they wish to bring into the world about climate change doesn't exist and women shouldn't have rights and blah, 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 blah. God There's, sent there, us Donald Trump. God sent us Donald what? Trump, literally. <laughs> and, and that's the thing is that we have to have that reorientation of persistence is that we have to focus on the small wins of watching these two, Nina <laughs> in his county commissioner and Caroline running in freaking Utah. I mean, those are, the, those are the small wins that we have to celebrate and also focus on as those are the goalposts. Every time we can move the goalposts two yards forward, three yards forward, that's a win. And really in the work that I've been doing, you know, Natives Outdoors, we do film and media work and really it's just trying to change the narrative around certain things around climate of just getting us to understand that the ways we spend time outside connects us, especially with skiing, connects us a part of the water cycle and the hydrological cycle that so few people in this world get to see. We know what our snowpack percentage is right now. What is it in this part of the world? Someone knows. Exactly. 94. So really close. 
<laughs> go down to Arizona. When I open my tap, that's all Colorado River water. If I were to ask someone in Tucson, what, how, what's, the water, what's the snowpack like in Colorado? No one has a clue. And the thing is, is that when we spend time outdoors and we enjoy our powder day, we know what that means for the water cycle. And in many respects, we become the advocates for that snow, that water, and what's happening in this part of the world. Because in many parts of this country, especially we're in the Colorado River Basin, you know, people in Los Angeles, 40% of their water comes from that, for, comes from the water that come, melts off this mountain. And, you know, how do they know? We're the people that have to tell them. And I think especially with what we're seeing around climate, we can become those advocates. And it doesn't have to be a big thing either. It's just telling your friend, telling your family, just keeping them in the loop. And that's politics. Politics at its core is local. And we just have to think about those small ways in which we can contribute to that message, contribute to these things that are affecting the world that we're living in. And the other side of the work that I do with Natives Outdoors and the Sonoran Avalanche Center is just getting out the vote. Like what I was saying, it's so easy for, to give up. It's so easy to look at the world and say it's all fucked, and it is kind of fucked. But, <laughs> but there are things that we can do to change the reality. I'm giving so many people beers right now. <laughs> um, uh, there's so many things that we can do to give, to give people a sense of what changes we can make in the world. And you know, the Snorn Avalanche Center at its core is just a shit posting account, I'm not gonna lie. But every four years, <laughs> Every four years, we ramp up that account to do voter messaging because quite honestly, voter messaging and talking about climate is like polishing a turd. Everyone sees it, they like scroll past it, and it's like whatever, I've seen that before. But when you see Cody Townsend popping up after a thirst trap to tell you to vote, I'm just gonna say, hacks the algorithm, it's shareable content. But really what we're trying to do, <laughs> You all got to see this. I'll repost it. But the really, <laughs> um, but really at its core is that we have the tools in our toolbox. We have the stoke in our communities to actuate this change and to make us feel like we can climb that fucking mountain. We can do these things together, but there's hope in the fact that in the small gains that we make in the process. So that's my soapbox. I'm going to get off. Dude, of. that is a fascinating connection. So I just finished this book, Tim Albert, The Power and the Glory, talking about how the evangelical movement has been co-opted into a political force of nature that is electing presidents. Why can't the outdoor recreation industry follow that model? Why, if we, we're all, like you said, we're all zealots, you know? We're so passionate about water and the mountains and getting outside. Why can't we take a page from the Jesus freaks in the 70s who turned that thing into a moral majority who now create presidents? I wonder that every fucking day. <laughs> Imagine. That's such I an mean, interesting comparison. You have to, we have to bring that grit, that grit yeah. that we have of getting better at our sports. It's so transferable to these other things. It doesn't take that much. Huh. It really doesn't. Right. I was going to add on to that, and I would say, like you were talking about, Nina, deciding to run for an office is the most terrifying thing I've ever Bad. done. Mm -hmm. I've done some scary shit before in my life. And file, set, signing that piece of paper and paying that fee and putting my name in the ring for that, absolutely terrifying. But as skiers and snowboarders, people in this room, we are addicted to adrenaline. And so you can really get your fix, you know, the <laughs> like we're adrenaline junkies. We love it. We live for this. Like we live for the thrill of getting the fresh line, like lining up all the factors so that we can be on the top of the peak right for sunrise, dropping in first and getting first tracks in perfect snow. Like that is what we do. And so if you can just take one for the team, you know, and <laughs> put your name in the hat and take all that same addiction to adrenaline and channel it to something else for a little bit, we could make really big progress there. And the other thing that I would say is like, this has been changing, but I still get this all the time. Shut up and ski. We don't want to hear about your politics. Like, I still hear that all the time. And if the outdoor recreation and ski industry wants to have the same political clout as oil and gas, 
We need to start funding campaigns and political candidates. Mm -hmm. We need to start investing in candidates, up and coming leaders, new leaders. If you guys would like to donate to my campaign, we need all the help we can get, whether it's $3, 300, 3300. We'll take it because that is what we need to run a Senate race in 2024. To run a Senate com a competitive Senate race, we need a lot of donors and a lot of money. Money shows our viability as candidates. So there's a lot of people watching to see what's going to happen with my race in Utah to see how viable this is. And I need your help because it is so scary to be in this position. Being a federal candidate, you open yourself up to so much criticism, harassment, bullying. You know, we have a crisis management plan for how we're going to deal with this. But the stakes couldn't be higher in 2024. We have to do everything we can to save our home planet, to take action on the climate crisis, to defend reproductive justice, to defend democracy. Like there is so much on the line. And that is why I'm doing this because I can't sleep at night knowing what the stakes are and knowing I didn't do everything I could to help. And thank you guys both for run for your service and working in government and Nina for running and serving because there are days that it just feels so overwhelming and hopeless. Like it does feel really hard and being a public servant, it's not like that, I mean, my other job as a professional skier is my dream job. It's like being a politician isn't my dream job. Like I don't see that any of the good people that step into that role, they actually want to do it, but they do it because it's important to serve. They do it because we need more diverse candidates representing Americans in DC, in county government, in state government. And we need, um, you know, the average age of America is 38, which is my age. And the average age of the Senate is 68. The average age of Utah is 33. And so we need just a more diverse array of candidates to run and to start developing their skills so that we can, so that we can be represented in all levels of government. The oldest governing bodies in the world are the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives. That is fucked. <laughs> yeah. But I can see why, because it's hard to run. Like, it yeah. is hard, but I hope that I can sandbag other skiers and other outdoor lovers to do it. Like, we're going to make it seem really fun, even when it's not. We're going to smile yes. through the suffering, and, like, we're going to try to take people along, bring people into this process, and, like Len was saying, pave the way so that it's easier for the next person. Mm -hmm. There's, like, a whole bunch of questions we have with the FEC about how I'm even going to do this as, like, a content creator with my other job, because I can't afford to give up my other job and do this. So we're going to try to set a legal precedent so that other people who make their living as athletes and content creators can do this and they have better legal framework because federal candidate like running for city state government is a little bit easier legally than running for a federal office mm -hmm. there's a lot of rules and fec jail is real jail so <laughs> we're trying to abide we're going to try to run this campaign with honesty integrity and openness to do it right and to make it easier for the next person yeah i think I think the reason why we don't mobilize as well as we could, there's something that, that mystique of the person living in the mountains. And Rugged little, individualism. Yes, yes, yes. This living in their little cabin by themselves. You man, you know, you, you dream of it. I know you do, right? You wish you could go up to the top of whatever mountain is your home mountain and ski that line with not a single soul in sight. Doesn't that sound peachy? Well, if that happens, our sport dies. So I'm, I'm sorry, like there's just no way around it. Our sport dies if we don't have people engaged in it. But then additionally, what else comes with it, right? What jobs do we lose? What economic foundation to our communities? What happens then? You know, there's so many, again, like everything we do, all of us is totally interconnected, all right? And I, and I, don't get me wrong, I think that there is like this idea of, you know, rugged individualism, but we are so much stronger together. And I think that, I, I mean, my soapbox last, last time I was here was a lot about, you know, I, we need you, allies. We need, we need not only those of us who are willing to put our names in the ring, but we need you to go out and speak on behalf of us. Because we're not going to be doing this alone with our, I mean, don't get me wrong, our social medias are dope. All of us. All right? Maybe these two better than mine, but still. 
Like, I think it's really important for uh, for you all to be, this is how you get engaged. You start talking to somebody about like, hey, did you know that Caroline is running for U.S. Senate in Utah? And somebody's going to say, well, I didn't know that. Tell me more about it. And then you, it opens out that gateway to just exploring, you know, what the differences are and what are the similarities that you have in policy or your ideas. I mean, I believe that we could actually change the future of the United States by engaging more with one another, but then also with the with the goals that in the America that we want to live in. So I don't know. I just have I think that there is a beauty and like solace and these beautiful sacred places. But if we don't start speaking about them, they're not going to be sacred for much longer. All right. There's a lot of people who want to take these places away from you, um, just for the almighty dollar. And um, I think that that's tragic and scary, and it's not unrealistic. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. <laughs> I think that's something that most people who recreate outside um, see that interconnectedness in nature. Like we we all can see it. You know, we see where the water's going to end up. We you know ski it in the spring and then go paddle it in the rivers. And then we watch them grow almonds in the arrogant the Imperial Valley with it. Um, we, we, we have a better grasp, I think, of the interconnectedness and, and how we are all connected. And it's starting to dawn on us in a community sense. And as we realize that we are a trillion dollar industry that ranks as one of the most powerful economic forces in the nation right now, fueling all sorts of rural economies, and we realize that we're we could be a political force. We could have a national office of recreation. We could have a cabinet position if, if this industry keeps pursuing what it is. And we could have Carolyn Gleick in the Senate advocating for the America Outdoors Act and all the different pieces of public lands legislation and, and realizing how interconnected that is to urban and every interest and how it's so important. Um, again, just to kind of you know, I'm obviously, I, I cover the outdoor recreation industry, so it's kind of a uh, hot topic of mine. But Caroline, when you look to D.C., what, what would be your, I don't know, top five priorities that would come out that people in this room would be like, bring it? Yes. I think, um, you know, first and foremost, more climate action mm -hmm. as a leading issue. Um, you know, we have the science, but we need the political will to implement those changes, to clean up our air, to clean our water, to protect public health. Um, we need also more funding for wildlife adaptation and mitigation because already we're seeing these historic floods. Like one of my friends in New Hampshire lost her house in the flood this fall, like a hundred year flood. Like she wasn't even in the flood zone, so she didn't have flood insurance. And these huge rains came and they washed away her house. She still has to pay her mortgage on her house that's no longer standing. So for people like her and for people that are being displaced and harmed by the effects of the climate crisis, which is just worsening, we need to have federal funding for mitigation and adaptation. And then I would say one of my priorities is defending democracy and expanding access to voting. And, um, you know, like something like the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to try to bring back a version of that. Um, that's really important to making sure that it's easier for people to engage with government. There is so much I see happening, especially at the state level in Utah, where our legislators are trying to make it more and more difficult for citizens to show up and make their voices heard. But that's not how our founding fathers and how the Constitution envisioned it. Like, we need people to be able to participate a little bit more easily in democracy. And so that would be another priority. A big thing I'd like to work on is changing campaign finance laws and ending Citizens United. Citizens United was the 2010 Supreme Court case that basically allowed unlimited spending to fund political candidates. And since then, we've seen this extreme division and like politics has become a much more, it's become a nastier game, especially in federal elections, when you have these outside forces that come in, fund super PACs, and run these terrible ads, you know, trying to tear down the other candidates. So that would be another thing that I would like to work on, is changing campaign finance. Absolutely. Nice. How about you, Len, working from outside of the political realm? Um, you know, 
Carolyn wins. She's in the Senate. You get a you get an hour with her in in her DC office. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think one of the our I, I have a dual mind. A lot of our institutions are broken. They have a lot of issues, but they're it's also ensuring that we make sure that these institutions operate and are something that we can give to those that come after us as our greatest gift. And, you know, the Trump administration, having worked for eight months in that fucking shit show and clown circus, like it was bad. And the ways and the people that they put in political positions was really crazy. Every time there's an administration change, there's a change of 4,000 political appointees across the entire, entire administration. These are the directors of offices in every freaking government agency you can imagine. And um, generally, those folks are vetted. They are you know, basically ensured that they are competent, capable, and not political shit shows, which we saw a lot in the Trump administration. And a lot of instances with the Trump administration, we saw a lot of sycophants and people that were just like Trump allies. They had like basically loyalty tests in order to become political appointees. And in this new administration, they know what they're doing now. What I saw in those that first eight months, year of that administration is that they were a junk show. But now they have, you know, they have four years under their belt. They know what to do and they're going to come in like fucking swinging and they're going to get the folks in those offices that are going to dismantle those institutions and make government even more ineffective than what we're seeing now. Because if they make government ineffective, it serves their narrative that government doesn't serve you as citizens. And it's really it's really chaotic. And. I'm going to disclose this right now, but literally I was a, I was a whistleblower on one, our political appointee in our office in 2017. I reported, you know, this guy was an anti-Semite and blah, 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 blah. He had a crazy Twitter back when being crazy on Twitter was a thing. <laughs> um, and I report, gave it to the Washington Post and I was like, you know, clearly this administration didn't vet this dude and this guy is like out of office rocker. And basically he was saying he was going to try to purge the Department of Energy of the deep state. And his definition of the deep state was people who believed in climate change or not believed, but just like supported climate change issues. Like that's who he was trying to that's who he was trying to purge. You imagine the next fucking four years of these motherfuckers coming into office. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy. They know what they're doing. And now they actually are going to try to implement it. So when I look at what what's ahead of us and what we need to do, we need to ensure that we support institutions. And yeah, like fucking Joe Biden's old as fuck. I get it. I get it. But what I look at is the people that he's appointed in every one of these 4,000 positions in government. And I know the people that are working as deputy assistant secretaries. Hell, they were trying to interview me to be one. Fuck. Like... <laughs> You know, I mean, they're crazy on their end, and I'm glad I didn't do it. But the thing is, is that they were they were high. They have hired really competent people to be in those positions of government, and that's actually what where government operates. In many ways, the executive is a figurehead. And what I look at is that we need to ensure that in any government moving forward, we're hiring competent people, capable people, people that have the skills and capabilities to be effective leaders and not just simply being yes men. And that's one thing. That's like on the governmental side. Institutions are important and it's really important that we maintain them and give them to future generations. I think to Caroline's point and Nina's point, we got it. We got to hire and think about who we're electing and like figure out how we can be that powerhouse to like hire or not hire <laughs> elect we are hiring effectively our politicians, but you know, we got it. We got, if we don't like what we see going on, we got to be that change in the world and say, Hey, who is the person that we would like to see in there? And we got to support them. And you know, the federal, the FEC contribution limit is $3,300. And I'm looking at this room, $3,300 times a hundred is a fuckload of money in this room. Give it to her. Caroline for Utah.com. Um, <laughs> there's ways. Small dollars matter. Those dollars matter. And that's the way that we can put our vote in early on and say, this is what I care about. This is what I'm for. The way that I'm doing it from the outside is running a freaking chaotic ass meme account. Um, because I look, and you know, I, I honestly wish to see. So for those that aren't, are unfamiliar with the Sonoran Avalanche Center, Tucson is the southernmost ski area in North America. 
we're going to probably be out of business in 10 years. Like, um, but really, every avalanche center in the U.S. will become the sooner an avalanche center if we continue down this path of not addressing climate change. And I tried to figure out social media is driving this conversation around climate and how do we change this narrative. And really, when we look at the algorithm, it's just like dumb shit gets hits. People <laughs> like that stuff. So like, let's hack that algorithm. Let's get this messaging in front of people to start thinking about these issues in a way that's less doom and gloom and more like, haha, that's funny, but also that's kind of dark. That's, that's, our, that's the center of the Venn diagram for us. Um, <laughs> But really, really, you know, we can shape narratives, we can create content that does imp like improbable things. And then the other side of that last two points is that in um, in uh, March, I'm going to be going down the Gila River, which is one of the few last flowing rivers in the Colorado Basin. And, you know, it's in southern New Mexico and it's this anomaly. It like continues to flow. But there's a reality in which we're looking 100 years from now where this river won't exist anymore. I'm going to be taking the house rep from that part of the world, Gabe Vasquez and Senator Martin Heinrich, if he freaking gets his act together, down this river for a pack raft trip and say, we're going to spend four days on this river together and we're going to think about why this place is important. And I think especially with folks like Caroline, if we can get more folks like Caroline running that know why these places are important, why these places matter, why they're connected into this larger ecosystem and why we need to protect them. Shit, man, like <laughs> think about how different Congress would be. Um, and the last piece of the work that I'm doing around that is that we're doing voter outreach and voter um, turnout in, in Arizona with native communities because historically like, um, San Juan County in southeastern Utah was on the voter rights uh, action list, but basically like any change that they made on, this was like one of the few counties out of the south that basically had to report to the Department of Justice on any change that they made to voting access, voting laws, whatever, because they were actively disenfranchising the native vote in southeast Utah. Like to the point that's on the level of like Strom Thurmond and those motherfuckers in the south. In freaking Utah. And now, because the Voting Rights Act has been gutted, we're having to freaking figure out ways around this to ensure that Native people in Utah can have the right to vote. Because the state of Utah and recently the state of Arizona are figuring out all the little loopholes that they can close to make it harder. So on the Navajo Nation, it takes like six, if for on average, it takes 60 miles for someone to go and vote. They have to go drive 60 fucking miles to go and vote if you live on the Navajo Nation. And that's because in the state of Arizona, they've, they've basically outlawed ballot harvesting. So your relatives who live in the same household as you can't take your ballot and take it to the ballot drop off. They've made that illegal because they realized in 2020, the native vote and the Navajo Nation flipped the election for Joe Biden in the state of Arizona. The increase in voter turnout on the Navajo Nation, 94% of the Navajo Nation voted for Joe Biden and the turnout was 140% normal. Wow. And that, the, the margin wow. in the state of Arizona for, you know, Arizona's 5 million people that is in the state and about 3 million voted, 10,000 votes. 10,000 fucking votes. And the Navajo Nation was on average, like basically, overdid that by 50,000. That's why. Huh. And now what came is that the other foot dropped and now they're passing all these bills to try to make it harder for Navajo folks to vote. That's that shit that matters. And you look at here, you were lucky to live here in Colorado if you're from here. Look at who your freaking house rep is in this part of the world. Who is it? Lauren Bober. Exactly. We call her Bobo around here. Bobo. And just, just think, and like how many votes did she lose by the, in the last election? 600. Exactly. And how many people live in this freaking town? 700, well, the district, Colorado district, 750,000 voters. Exactly. Yeah. And think about, how many, think about how many people did not vote in this district that said, oh, I'm a transient worker, I shouldn't work here, blah, blah, blah. Those are the people that you need to hit in this next election and say, turn out, change your registration, get on it. That's my call to action. Get your homies to vote. Nina, when you hear Len with that call to action to get out the vote, to reach those under, under voiced communities, and you hear him predict, project, 
a Trumpian stocking of our American bureaucracy. You feel a weight on your shoulders to help carry, <laughs> carry a little more water, Commissioner Waters, and, uh, <laughs> at a local level and help us I don't know, make the change in our own community before we start fighting the big fight in D.C.? No. Good for you. Because <laughs> I have hope. I can't, I can't live in a world, I can't live in an America where I don't wake up every day hopeful that we can do the right thing. I, I have to believe it. If I didn't believe it, what would be the point of existing? So I, every day, I, I, I mean, shit, it's hard. There is a uphill climb that we all will be engaged in. And I think that, you know, it doesn't, it, voting, one piece. Running, another piece. The power of public comment. Mm -hmm. You all live in a town or a county. You live somewhere. There are people making, like I said, there are people making decisions about your day-to-day -day life every single day or once, at least once a week. And you get to show up and you get to tell them what you think about that. I actually get to leave this tomorrow morning at 5.30 in the morning because I have the joy of entertaining about 90 short-term rental guests that are uh, activists who get to tell me how I am ruining their economy with short-term, with putting um, regulations on short-term rentals. So, and I'm going to listen to them because I think that that's appropriate and I think that that's fair and I would never want anybody to disrespect me even for something that I believed in. I firmly believe that. But they're showing up in mass. And on the other side, we have no one. We have no one who's going to protect the rights of all of those workers, all those disenfranchised people. We're working. They're, exactly. <laughs> and I have all their thoughts in which, yeah, like, like Len said, institutions do matter. But there are definitely changes that mm -hmm. we can enact. And that comes from you. The power of that public comment means so much. I have witnessed it happen on more than one of occasion in the town of Breckenridge, Colorado, where I came in and I said, I don't think that this is a good idea. Have you thought about doing it this way? And the whole room shifted. You have that power, every single one of you. And so I, I think that we need to step into that power. I've been blessed to be raised, raised by a wonderful, strong black Puerto Rican woman who said, you exist and you are important. And I believe that every single one of you are important. All right. So Miriam is telling you through me that y'all's is important. <laughs> all right. And that you can make a difference. Like that, that fatalism, that defeatism, that, it's just not going to work any longer. We can't. It's, it, it's dire straits at this point in time. So I, I don't feel personally that, you know, it's impossible because look at, look at us here, all, all of us in, on this stage, speaking in front of all of you. That, that wouldn't have even happened probably five years ago. But yet we have decided that we want to change. We want to do better. So now, here we are telling you in front of, in front of each of every one of you that you can do it. And I hope that this invigorates you to wake up tomorrow and check out what's going on in your county commissioner meeting, what's happening in that work session, what's happening on your town council agendas. They are required by law to make it public, and they are required by law to listen to you speak. So take advantage of that. Use your rights. It's America, damn it. <laughs> I would like to add to that as well. Um, and to hold space and acknowledge like depression and anxiety. Because when I grew up as a kid, I really struggled with depression and anxiety. Like as a teenager, I went to rehab when I was 13 because I was just like trying to find a way to deal with this feeling of hopelessness and this deep pit of despair, you know? I felt really hopeless about the world at times. And you see all these problems, like you see wars happening and you see climate catastrophes and you see burning of fossil fuels and the drying of the Great Salt Lake. You see people experiencing homelessness and there's a lot of grief. It's a heavy weight to see that. And sometimes it does feel like, what can I do? And I struggled as a young person trying to figure out what my path was. Like I felt hopeless a lot. I felt depressed a lot. I turned to drugs and alcohol a lot. 
and my senior year of college, I had waited to take the prerequisite American national government. I thought it sounded boring. I wasn't that interested in it. And I had a professor that changed my life. And that first day of the course, he asked us, how do you want to interact with government? Do you want your interactions just to be when you pay taxes or get a speeding ticket? Or do you want to proactively come to the table as a citizen activist, a concerned citizen, and use government as a problem-solving tool? And he would invite us to participate in these political forums where we'd hear from thought leaders and elected officials. And he made his test so hard that he'd give you extra credit to do these and even more if you asked a question. And what I didn't realize at that time is that is exactly what the process is to participate in government at a city council meeting or a state legislature meeting. You show up, you do a little research, you ask a good question, you make a little comment, and that is, it was great training. And at the end of that class, like, I loved it. All of a sudden, I was like, this is the best class I took. And he encouraged me to apply for a political internship. So I did an internship for the governor of Utah's environmental advisor, Ted Wilson, for Governor Gary Herbert, and I really learned how to take a seat at the table, how to run a meeting, how to step into my power. And I found that taking that kind of action was an antidote for depression. That action is like, it was a turning point for me. And it gives my life purpose and meaning. It gets me out of bed in the morning. And um, I just find it as a really powerful way to help find solutions to the problems that are facing the world today. All right, everybody, you heard the commissioner. Stack them up 20 deep in front of that mic. This is your <laughs> chance. Hi. Uh, so as the son of two federal employees, uh, as a land development engineer, and as somebody who went to school for environmental engineering and has an MBA in sustainable development, I hear your, your optimism and your hope because you have to. For those who are young, and I'm probably one of the younger ones here, how do you find that? Because I grew up with Katrina. I grew up with the forest fires. I went to school in, at Colorado State during COVID when the sky was black from the fires that were encroaching on our town. How do you find that? How do you find that hope? Because there are days where I wake up, read the news, and it makes me wanna go jump in front of a bus. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you find that hope? And where do you find it from? Just little anecdotes. I can fully go there. <laughs> I come from a community on the Navajo Nation that literally saw the world end in 1868. We got put in an internment camp. Uh, about half of our people died. I'm, I'm a descendant of that other half that survived. We were, that internment camp that we got put in was the blueprint and framework that Adolf Hitler looked at in creating the concentration camps in Europe. We got sent back to a reservation where we were given no water, no ability to feed ourselves. The world ended. And I always look back at that and I think about, you know, the relatives of mine that died crossing the, Colo the Rio Grande because they couldn't swim. And I'm here. I'm here sitting at this table talking to you in front of this microphone having some modicum of success. And it was because those people didn't give up. They saw the world end, the world kept going, but their world was ending. And I think one of the things that I always look back on and I always remember is that if they hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here to enjoy that. And I think that's one of the things that I always try to, like I deal with depression and anxiety about the future of the world. like. There's a wonderful meme, like, you know, there's a, <laughs> you know, the, the, N, the, the NBC thing, the more you know, it's like the star going across the thing. The meme that I'm referencing is the more you know, the more you suffer. And, you know, having gotten a doctorate in engineering and public policy and studying climate change and like seeing that the things that I was reading in literature that they were saying was supposed to happen in 2050 is happening today. Holy fuck, <laughs> like these, the, it's like, I know too much. I see too much, these things are going on. And I look at the tools that what my community had when they were basically on the brink, like literally the policy of the government at that time was to exterminate them. Like imagine that. 
we're going to exterminate all skiers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The part I'm laughing about that because the humor you have to have in it is that even in the darkest, most fucked up times is that humor is a tool that we can use to think about things differently and seeing it from a different angle. And yeah, climate change is fucked up. Like, God, like <laughs> I thought I had it bad growing up with 9-11 and my world was fucked from that. But yeah, like having like I totally recognize the ways in which is like the goalposts just keep getting moved with every catastrophe and everything that's happening. But the thing is, is that humor is the tool that we can use to engage and talk about things in a different way. And I, I say this coming from the Navo perspective of that we use humor as a tool to do that because it's a, it's a tool of survival. It's a tool that got us through the hardest times. And even in the times when we were in the concentration camp, we people were laughing. I know that for a fact, people were laughing at their predicament. And what humor does, and I would say broad, like having lived a reality where I'm half white, half Navajo, white folks don't know how to laugh at shit. <laughs> like, you take shit too seriously. Like, shit's <laughs> fucked up. You got to laugh at it. It's like sometimes it's out of your control. And sometimes you have to find the humor in it. And there's nothing wrong with laughing at it. Because if you laugh at it and find a little bit of solace and relief from the despair, and you get in a place of being able to take action, that's a better place to be than to continue being that place of despair. And so, yeah, it's like the Snorn Avalanche Center. We joke about fucking skiing rocks, but I guess that's a thing here at CB. <laughs> <laughs> that's the calling card here. But, you know, I say humor is a big one. The other thing is that we, throughout human history, I always remember is that humans have lived Oh, we've been hum the human species has been in way more fucked up positions in history than we are now. We have technology at our disposal. We have a shitload of people that have brains and can think things through. In the Navajo creation story, and I can tell this because there's snow on the ground. We can't tell this when there's not snow on the ground. Um, but there was a there was a time in in we have a great flood story like every society in the world. But there was a time prior to that when diseases, monsters, all these other things were killing humans. And there was only a small group of humans left. And basically, first man and first woman who were there, were bas they were saying, we don't know if we're going to survive. We don't know if we're going to be able to continue on forward. And um, the, the one woman, changing woman, Immaculate Conception, was impregnated by the sun, gave birth to these twins, the hero twins. And the twins were dualistic. One was very aggro, just wanting to fucking send the line, didn't care about the Avi risk. The other twin, the other twin read the Avi report, knew before he go, knew before he went, but was willing to take the risk when necessary. And those two twins saved humanity. And it was from, it, and they couldn't have done it alone. It took both of those inclinations of knowing when you can take risk and like go for it and the other times when you needed to pull back. And the story goes is that those twins vanquished all these monsters and saved the humanity to live another day. And that's one of the things that I always reference back of like thinking about in my own life of like how do I embody those hero twins is that I learn as much as I can and I'd be like the born for water twin. And then when I know, like Clairline, it's time to go, time to send it, whatever, that's when you're the monster slayer. And I think in, in your own life, and feel free to appropriate this story, <laughs> but you know, in your own life, it's like you have to be scared, but you also have to know when to take action and when to you know, be that warrior and when to be that person to stand up because there's a lot of other people that are scared, but the minute that you are that warrior, then a lot of other people will follow. And that's, that's kind of that leadership. And you won't always occupy that for your whole life. And it's always those moments where it's like, you know you're capable, you know you can do this, and you know when it's time to send, you fucking send. Don't question it, don't have that you know, doubt in your mind. And really, when we're looking at the climate future that we're facing, it's going to take all of us, but it's going to take a lot of us inspiring those around us to not feel so scared about the future that we're entering together. Because it's going to be kind of wild. I mean, I was reading about the state of Colorado has a water weather modification program in this state, which is kind of crazy. It was like we're already at that point, but you know, 
we're going to have to figure out together. And I think like knowing that you're thinking about this and this is something that you're scared about. Hell yeah. Like that gives me the ammunition to say, I need to be that leader. I need to stand up and be that person that inspires folks like you to fucking follow my footsteps. Step on up. Come on up. Uh, my question for y'all is how do we keep people engaged? You know, we're on the third or fourth most important election of our lives. How do we keep people engaged <laughs> to their care about a statewide, a regional-wide, local-level politics? Because burnout is real in this. Um, how do we keep people engaged so that they care about stuff, you know, like the short-term rental stuff that's going on in Summit County? How do we care about a local election, not just a presidential election? Yeah, how do you stay engaged? I guess find something new. There's a lot of problems to solve, you know, one day. And that's what, I, I guess that's what's keeping it fresh for me personally, is like it first started, I, I started asking questions because I, I, I'm a whitewater rafter. That's my, my jam in the summer. And I asked the question of, well, why? why can we only boat on this river for two months out of the year versus like all the months of the year? And then I started opening up the rabbit hole that is water in the state of Colorado. <laughs> and then, you know, it just opened up my life. And then that changed from water to climate activism. And then that climate activism turned into um, social services because if people don't have the base, their basic needs met on a regular basis, then they aren't gonna be caring about climate. And then that turned into, uh, you see what I'm saying? Like there's, there is always something new to kind of focus on. And you don't need to be the subject matter experts. There, there are plenty of nerds who are gonna do that for you. You just have to just read something listen to a podcast, stay engaged. And I think that, yeah, it might seem fatalism, but at that this is the most important election of your life, but every election is going to be the most important election of your life because your life depends on it. Our future depends on it. So unfortunately, I don't have any like really great news to say that like this, this is important. I think that's, that's the mistake we've been making for a really long time is that we've just said, okay, well, we're gonna let these people, these leaders just lead and they'll just take care of all of our problems. And we, you see where we have gotten with that. So now it's time for us to do the opposite and try something new. And maybe, who knows, maybe we will have a democracy that functions appropriately. That'd be a novel idea. But I don't know if we can't, we, I don't think we're that close to it right now. Again, I have hope, but. Yeah. I, I would just add on to that, too, that when I get in those lulls of burnout, I think it helps to, like, call up a couple friends or call up some new people. As a, as a candidate now, what I have to do is go through every single contact in my phone and call these people for, like, 10 hours a week, every single person that I've ever saved. It's like all these random people I met in a bar in my 20s. I'm like, I don't even know who this person is. I'll call them anyway. I'll tell them I'm running. I'll see if they can support the campaign. And you know what? It's been really fun to talk to all these people, this blast from my past. And um, <laughs> it gives me energy to keep me going. And yeah, sometimes at the end of the call time, I cry a little bit because it feels some days aren't as good as others. But when you hear someone's voice on the phone or when you meet with someone in real life, it gives you energy. It gives you that wind in your sails and it keeps you going. And so if you're getting burnt out, also, you know, go for a ski, take a break, get, step away from the screens for a little bit, but then call some friends and make it social because we can do a lot more together than we can alone. One of the things that I think about, um, there's a, there was a study done in the early 2000s about the heat waves that were hitting Chicago and looking at mortality because heat waves are going to be are already a part of our reality now. There's a thing called a wet wet bulb temperature event. If you want to, you should go Google it and it's pretty crazy, but we already had these temperature events in the south already. Um, basically, it's 90 degrees wet, 94 degrees wet bulb temperature is the point at which no matter how much cooling, how much shade you have outside, you will die. We had these moments in the South already, but one of the things I look back on this particular study in Chicago is that they look at social networks and how well connected people are to their neighbors and to their community. And they found that people that knew their neighbors, knew their community were embedded, were like four, not even 40 times more likely to survive these sorts of climate events. And so in many ways, 
social media detract, you know, <laughs> removes us from community in a big way, but almost our biggest call in how to address climate is just knowing your neighbors, knowing who's around you, knowing what's going on, being embedded in local issues. That's key. I think the other is like, yeah, it's, I, I my first election that I voted in was in 2008. And it was like, oh wow, democracy's cool, you know? Turns out it's kind of a mess. <laughs> But you know, the thing is, is that voting is the least, if we look at the things that we do in our lives, how much effort it takes to go out and go ski for a day or do a backcountry day, so much fucking effort compared to just checking your voter registration, keeping that stuff up to date. And then just here in the state of Colorado, I mean, for God's sake, you have mail-in ballots. And same day registration. And same day <laughs> registration. It's such a low effort thing. It's such a low effort thing. And just getting educated, just think about the issues. What do you care about? If you care about skiing, that's water issues, that's climate issues. If you care about democracy, blah, blah, blah. There's just, you just focus on the issues that you're concerned about and look at the candidates and how they're aligned. And that's all you need to do. You don't need to do much more research than that. And then showing up and doing it is like such a painless thing. In places like, uh, you know, on the res, like people are driving three hours to go vote and might not even have the money to pay for the gas to put in their car to go do it. And yet, even with those, <laughs> I just say, even with those barriers, and we can talk about the state of Arizona's election laws, the voter turnout of like registered voters on the Navajo Nation in 2020, despite those barriers, was 95%. There's no fucking reason why you need to stay home. If you have money to put gas in your car to do whatever, you're not driving 80 miles. You're not driving to Montrose to go vote, right? So just put that in perspective and just say, how much effort is this gonna take? And secondly, if you got a little bit more time, talk to three friends. Are you registered to vote? What are you cared about? Do you know who you're voting for? Have you made a plan? Easy, easy conversation over a beer. And I'm probably gonna ask a bunch of you after this, do you have a plan to vote? Um, and that's the way in which it's like, these like these elections that are like you know the elections of our lifetime become less consequential. It's like I've done my part and I'm making sure that my community is doing their part and that's it. Hi, uh, one of the things that crosses my mind is how does the other uh, side of these issues a able to drum up so much support and voting? And um, I think like one of the uh, answers that comes to my mind is. Uh, they're able to, you know, sort of mobilize in, in these small communities. A lot of things like an example would be the church. Um, they, they have to mobilize there. So I guess my question is, how do we turn the ski mountain and the outdoors into the church? Yeah, that's what you were talking about earlier. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. We, we, we go to church every time we go up that skin track, man. <laughs> right? I mean, imagine I've had one, one interaction I had in Jackson I was like, I'm just going to go ask every motherfucker I see on the skin track if they vote. Turns out about 50% of them did, you know, and that's, that's the thing is that we have that common communal space where we come together and enjoy something together. We get our dopamine hits out sliding around, you know, for others, it's singing hymns or whatever they do in there, but no, no shade on that. I mean, people do the, got their things going on, but they have a community built around that. And I think so much of our sports and what we do are very individualistic and, you know, just like kind of our own pursuits and how we're doing. But, so, you know, we can't go in the back. I mean, you can go in the back country alone, but, you know, we know how that goes. Um, but the really it's like we build a community around these things. And those are our social networks that we can tap into. Those are those shared spaces and shared experiences that we can basically have that level of trust in talking to others that, you know, talking to a stranger on the street, we couldn't have that same rapport. And we need to start, I don't want to go down this road, we need to start looking down these things in like a similar way of the, the reason why the right and the far right can organize so quickly is they go to fucking church every day. Or not every day, every Sunday. Well, my family goes to church every day, but that's a whole different story. Um, but that's the thing is that we have communities, we have social networks, and those are the things that we can tap into and have those hard conversations about what people are dealing with, what people are struggling with. We don't have to agree, but simply just having that opportunity to do that. I keep looking at 
the all the workers that are at these mountains temporarily like you know basically they can all like a lot of them could vote but a lot of them probably don't because of they consider home somewhere else that it, i just think about just like the the freaking ski mountains within a 30 miles radius of here there's 600 votes that could have sw swung that last election if we got them out and really it takes only a handful of people being those people talking to people and bringing voting to the fore and not doing it in a way that's like, you need to vote this way, but it's like, have you made a plan? What are you planning on doing? I think that's key. I think the other thing is that the, the you know, looking at the right, the far right and how they're organizing is a lot of it's around fear. And a lot of us don't live, don't like living in that space of fear, but for a lot in that space, that's their religious belief and like their, larger views of salvation and whatever is driven by fear but really when we look at fear it's a very it, it's a it's a it's an emotion that doesn't have a long-term sticking power eventually people kind of come out of it and say i don't like living in this this is making me stressed out really the message of hope is that like you know the electric snow plow i mean like the there's if you guys haven't heard about the infrastructure act that got passed i mean there's going to be billions of dollars like every day the last figure i saw is that every day in this country there's 130 level two electric vehicle chargers being installed in this country about 100 something like that and you think and then multiply that by 365 that's 365,000 electric vehicle chargers that are going to be in this country by the end of the year and i think those messages of hope and saying things can get better they're incremental really is where i think that's the longer lasting motivation and hope that can get us to that place of working together. And I always try to think about what are the things that are happening and how can we relay those messages through the lens of hope because that's the sticking power and that's what will get us over up to the summit. All right, I think we're gonna wrap it. Thank you guys. <laughs>